Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring topics of importance right into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field representative with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm your host this evening. Tonight we're going to be talking about uh, something vitally important to union members and community members uh, in Rhode Island and in particularly in Providence. We're going to be talking about contract negotiations in the city of Providence. And who better to talk about uh, contract negotiations for teachers than the president of the Providence Teachers Union. I'm happy to uh, let you know that uh, we are joined today by Mary Beth Calabro. Mary Beth, thanks for joining us today. You're welcome, thank you for having me. So before we talk about what's going on with bargaining, or what's not going on with bargaining <laughs> as it may be, uh, why don't we get a little bit of background. First of all, how, how long have you been a teacher? Um, this is my 24th year of teaching. Um, I've been teaching in Providence for my entire career. I'm a special educator um, and I've taught at Nathaniel Green Middle School for about 22 of the 24 years that I've taught. Okay. And you grew up in Providence? Um, no, I actually grew up in North Providence, but um, when I started teaching in 1993-94, um, we had the residency rule, so I moved into Providence because I wa really wanted to teach in, in Providence. So I moved um, to Chalkstone Avenue and I moved, I lived there for several years and then I moved to um, another uh, street in, in Providence and I lived there for another four or five years. So it's a big union that you represent. About uh, how many members do you have right now? We currently have about 1,940 members. And uh, most are full-time teachers. You have some part-time teachers as well? 99% um, are full-time mm -hmm. teachers, yes. So people may think that being a president of a union that size would be a full-time job, but you actually spend some time in the classroom. How much How much yes. teaching do you do? So um, I am released part of the time, so my mornings I spend at Nathaniel Green um, co-teaching special education students in a regular ed setting. Um, I'm there for the first two periods of the morning, so from 8 a.m. to a little after 10. Yeah. So it must uh, help with your credibility at the bargaining table when you talk about teacher issues because you're still doing it every day. I, I think it does. I, I, I think that it brings um, a different lens to the job as, as far as being a, a teacher at the, the school level. Um, I had also worked outside of the school level um, for a couple of years doing innovation work for um, the RAFT and um, the district uh, and I worked as the uh, evaluation coordinator for the district. But the money ran out so I went back to my classroom. <laughs> <laughs> so what is going on with your contract negotiations right now and, and more specifically what is the status of your contract? Did it did it expire? Are you working under an old contract? So we are currently um, on an expired contract. Our a contract expired in August. Um, we started negotiations a year ago, February. Um, we are at a stalemate right now. Um, the last conversation, negoti actual negotiation session that we had, um, the mayor's um, team of two came to the table and basically said that they had offered us some salary increases and language changes, et cetera, and um, we were on the right path. And then he basically pulled everything off the table and said they could offer us nothing. Um, so they offered us a 0% for this year, a 0% for next year, and I got a maybe, you'll get a 0.5% in the third year. Yeah, and that certainly would make you fall further and further behind other public school teachers in Correct. Rhode Island. Correct. We're, we're in the lower tier of, of public school teachers in, in the state of Rhode Island, um, comparatively speaking, in terms of salary benefits and, um, and stipends. I know one thing uh, that I mentioned to others, uh, when I used to compare teacher salaries you know, 15, 20 years ago, you used to see uh, not only Providence, but other urban districts near the top of uh, what pay scales were. That's Correct. no longer true. That's absolutely not true. We, we were at the top, um, and through 
multiple negotiations of multiple contracts. Um, we've taken zero percent for a couple of um, a couple of years. We took um, small percentages. We had a pay freeze. We had a step uh, freeze. So we we've done our fair share of of concessioning in in negotiations over the past years, and which has unfortunately brought us to the, close to the bottom. Yeah. So I, I'm not going to ask you to reveal any details about the salary offer, of course, but um, what explanation, if any, was given by, by the mayor's folks when they took things that were on the table off? So interestingly enough, um, on January 3rd, the mayor um, talked about having a surplus that, for the city, $5 million surplus for the city. And on January 19th, when we met, um, there was no money for teachers. So um, I think that the, the reason they used was financial um, distress and, and the fact that there's no money in the city. I don't know how we lose $5 million in 16 days, um, except for either misinformation or mismanagement, but um, apparently we lost $5 million in six days. What I think happened, um, what, what I believe happened, is that um, we were basically put on the pay no mind list. And the mayor himself said on the Dan York show that um, he had a lawsuit pending with the firefighters, so he felt that was pressing. And he has binding arbitration with the police, so he felt like he needed to negotiate contracts with those two entities. Um, and I think that we were put, like I said before, on the pay no mind list. And um, he figured he would deal with us when, when he could or if he would. So you don't have any sense that the, they have a sense of urgency in getting this contract? No, I, and I've said this before. I don't think there's any sense of urgency on the mayor's behalf for a, co um, a couple of reasons. One, I think that we don't have binding arbitration. Two, we didn't get the continuing contract um, language at the General Assembly, although the General Assembly passed it overwhelmingly and the mayor vetoed it. The General Assembly failed yeah, the, to yeah, come back. The governor and, vetoed it. So. I mean, the, I'm sorry, the governor mm -hmm. vetoed it and um, the General Assembly failed to take it up again. Mm -hmm. So um, we don't have continuing contract. We don't have binding arbitration. And um, I don't have any lawsuits in my back pocket that I could press upon the mayor to you know, force him to show his hand. So I think that, um, and I also think that he doesn't have any formidable opponents in terms of his mayoral race, so I don't think that having um, labor strife is, means anything to him at, at this point. Now, you and your uh, union did give the members an opportunity to express their displeasure during his uh, State of the City address in, in Providence City Hall. We why did. don't you talk about that a little bit? Why, um, you know, why that particular moment, and what was the message, or what were you trying to accomplish at that event? So um, it was interesting because shortly after um, they reneged on the, the potential offers that they had put on the table. I received an email inviting me to the mayor's state of the city. Um, and I found it to be um, ironic at best that I would be invited to the state of the city so that he could talk about all the wonderful things that he's done, uh, including having a surplus, um, while he's telling us that there's no money. So um, I met with my executive board and I said, you know what, I, I think we need to I think we need to show up at the state of the city. Um, and I think we need to show up as a, a bargaining unit, not just as, um, as one individual or the board. Um, the mayor has been heard to say that I don't represent um, what teachers say because teachers talk to him. Um, and I don't have the pulse of my membership. Um, he was also overheard saying that I would only bring about 150 people um, to the state of the city. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, both of those um, statements were incorrect, mm -hmm. um, significantly incorrect, if I might say, because um, we had about 1,100 people there. And um, I was proud to see all of the teachers that had come out. Um, I was very grateful to RIFT and, and all of our um, affiliates, presidents, and um, their members who came out in support of us, the Teamsters, um, the Providence Police. We, we were very, very well supported um, in that endeavor. I just think that um, it was uh, an eye-opener for the mayor. And um, I started speaking about 10 to 15 minutes before the mayor came in. And so, and I did that strategically because I didn't want to speak at the same time as he did. 
um, but I wanted to speak before him and ha allow my um, my membership to um, just feel like they could respond to me and what I had said um, to them prior to the mayor speaking. And um, then the the rally took on a life of its own, and um, he was overspoken and overshouted, and and um, I think and I hope he got the message. So shortly after that, I believe shortly after that, um, I, I remember hearing in the media that uh, the mayor started talking about a transformational contract. Yes, what, actually, what's it was the story on that. It uh, was <laughs> forty-five minutes after the rally. Um, he came out and he said he was looking to uh, do a transformational contract, which was interesting because in the eleven months prior to that um, statement, we had never heard of the words transformational contract. Mm -hmm. um, they were never entered into negotiations. We never knew what they meant. Um, and when asked and pressed, he, he clearly didn't have an answer or response to what a transformational contract mm -hmm. is. And um, over, over the past couple of weeks, uh, I, I think he gives little sound bites and dribs and drabs of what he believes a transformational mm -hmm. contract is, but I don't believe that there is a cohesive plan for a transformational mm -hmm. contract, whatever that definition is that the mayor has of it. Um, the Providence Teachers Union has consistently and constantly been transformational in um, in writing contracts. We have um, school-based autonomy in our contract. We have peer assistance and review in our contract. So we have a lot of things that are outside of the box thinking mm -hmm. um, in our contract that currently exists. Um, so I'm not quite sure what we're looking to transform. Yeah. What, um, what is it going to look like going forward in the near future? You know, here it is the spring, um, you know, we're, uh, we're in April uh, mm -hmm. by the time this is aired. Uh, what hopes do you have to get this thing resolved before the school year ends? So uh, it's my hope that we, we get back to the table and there's an actual um, conversation from the other side that is talking about realistic um, benefits and salary increases that are, were afforded to our brothers and sisters in police and fire. I, I don't think that we should be treated disparately. I don't think that um, we should have been put on the pay no mind list. Our teachers, after being fired all those years ago, showed up to work the next day. All of us showed up. And although we've been without a contract since um, sep uh, no August 31st, September 1st, our teachers are still showing up, and they're still doing the work, and they're still doing everything that they need to do um, to improve student achievement and, and what's best for kids. And, and that's why um, it was frustrating for me to hear people talk about the rally um, and how um, they thought it was in poor taste or whatever. Um, but everything we do and everything we have done um, against this mayor and, and to, to show the community where we are in terms of negotiations has not been at the expense of children, and we're very specific about that. That's why we have not done rallies during the day. We have not done sick outs or walk outs or any of those things. Um, what we have done is we had a, a, a first rally, and there will be another one. Um, <clears throat> I won't share when yet. I want, I want it to be a surprise. <laughs> um, but um, there will be other events, and um, I fully expect my membership, from what I hear on a daily basis, to um, participate in the, in the manner and with the enthusiasm that they did to the last rally. Uh, we only have a, a minute or so mm -hmm. left, but uh, could you talk just a little more about what you mean by disparate um, treatment, you know, uh, you know, the mayor treating teachers different than you know, other yeah, workers? Yeah, sure. In the so city? Our, um, if you look at our contracts and, and you look at our benefits and, and, our, um, and our salaries, uh, the the fire department got a five-year contract. We didn't even have a contract. Um, the, the police got a three-year contract, and the average um, salary increases for both of those is about 3.25%, and we weren't offered anything near that. We also pay significantly more in health care than both of our um, counterparts in, in police and fire. Um, in health, in terms of health care, you know, I, I just think that there needs to be um, some equity in the way that we're treated in terms of the seriousness of negotiations. Just because I don't have um, binding arbitration or, like I said, a million dollar, eleven million dollar lawsuit in my back pocket, doesn't mean that we should not be um, taken seriously and have given respect. Yeah, 
someone who may want to call themselves progressive would be hard pressed to be a progressive if they're treating a female dominated profession like teachers so differently than some male dominated professions. Correct. Exactly. Mary Beth, we're out of time. Thank you so much thank for you. joining us. Thanks. <laughs> and thank you for joining us for this edition of Life Edition. Good evening and welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Jim Riley, I'll be your host tonight. Tonight we are discussing the difference between for-profit and non-profit healthcare delivery systems. Specifically here in Rhode Island, where currently a Los Angeles, California company called Prospect Medical Holdings is in partnership with Brown University to buy Care New England, the second largest healthcare provider in the state of Rhode Island. My guest tonight is Chris Kalachi, who is a general counsel for the uh, United Nurses and Allied Professionals, or UNAP. Uh, Chris, why don't we get started by you telling us something about UNAP, who you are, who your membership is. Uh, UNAP, uh, Jim, is the largest healthcare union in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, <clears throat> we have upwards of 7,000 members, and uh, they stretch as far south as Westerly Hospital to as far north as Landmark Medical Center and many points uh, in between. Yeah. Okay, now we're gonna be talking about Prospect Medical Holdings. You know, it's almost fitting that these guys should be from Los Angeles, California, because where I sit, they seem like just a bunch of bad actors. So uh, tell us a little something about Prospect Medical Holdings and uh, uh, it sounds like this for-profit model really doesn't work well for people looking for health care in Rhode Island or anywhere else for that matter. Well, so you took the words out of my mouth. The first thing I would say when somebody asked me about Prospect Medical Holdings is I say that they are lousy corporate citizens and they're bad, bad actors. Uh, as you say, they're from the West Coast. Uh, they're playing around with millions of dollars of private equity money from uh, um, Wall Street, in particular Leonard Green, and uh, they're in the business of making money, uh, not necessarily providing quality patient care, and their record reflects that from the West Coast to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us an idea of some of the problems they've had in California? Well, so in California, uh, the feds uh, had to shut down uh, a surgical unit in one of their hospitals because it was so filthy that it was presenting uh, uh, significant risks to patients with respect to uh, infection. Um, when the government came in to look at that hospital, looked at several others, they found that they were not properly storing biohazardous waste. They were not properly storing uh, very critical uh, uh, patient medications. Uh, some of their physicians were not properly credentialed. They were not properly staffing um, the, the ICU. Uh, the list goes on. So these are the kinds of things that were going on out on the West Coast, and for that reason, this federal government cited them. Hmm. Well, bad actors indeed. And uh, that's not the only place they've had problems either, is it? Well, it isn't. Uh, they've got a pretty lousy record, whether it's on the West Coast or the East. Uh, we'll work our way to Rhode Island, but take Pennsylvania, for example. Mm -hmm. um, they just recently bought a, a five uh, hospital system down in Pennsylvania called uh, Crozier Health System. And uh, there have been nurses on picket lines down there complaining that they have drastically reduced the number of nurses at the bedside, which obviously is gonna ha have a negative impact on the uh, quality of care. They have complained that they've reduced the number of sanitation workers so that the hospitals are dirtier. Uh, they have complained that they don't have appropriate uh, security. In one hospital in particular, we had that nurse down there was badly assaulted and got a concussion. Uh, that's their handiwork uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, among a few other things that we may get to during your show. Hmm. Well, as we all know, safe staffing saves lives. Uh, you've had to take them on yourself uh, here at Fatima, is that right? Uh, we have had to take them on. They came to Rhode Island and they bought Fatima Hospital and Roger Williams Medical Center back in uh, 2014. So they've been operating those hospitals for uh, three and a half or four years. Um, last spring, uh, they had a uh, survey uh, done, they did it uh, in-house within their hospital of places in the hospital, including the OR, and what they found was that uh, the surgical instruments were either contaminated with foreign material, worn, cracked, broken, and needed to come out of circulation. And so they hired a consultant to take a closer look at it. Consultant produced a report the union, because we represent the RNs, the RNs there, asked for a copy of the report. They refused to give it to us. 
We filed a charge with the National Labor Relations Board, Region 1 in Boston, and said they're breaking the law, they're violating federal labor law by not disclosing this and by hiding these details from the public. Um, subsequent to that, in the fall, an outside commission came in and did a survey of the hospital and found 30 deficiencies. We asked for information about the deficiencies. They said, we're not going to give it to you. We filed another complaint with the NLRB. And I just heard from the NLRB last week. They are issuing a complaint against Prospect. They will be suing Prospect to get them to give us the information. And what's happening here, obviously, Jim, is that they are trying to prevent the public from knowing what's going on in the hospital and what for-profit means when it comes to employee and patient safety. Let's talk about uh, patient safety. Patients' lives really are, are, are in jeopardy here. Um, this is a company that issues uh, $600 million in dividends to their shareholders, and yet they still have these kinds of problems and investigations and lawsuits and whatnot. Who would want to do business with them? Well, you, 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 hit, the, you hit the nail on the head. What that, what that is, meaning that $600 million dividend payment to shareholders, that's Exhibit A. Mm -hmm. as to why it is that for-profit and health care don't go together. Um, in fact, that dividend payment was so significant, $600 million, as you point out, that uh, Moody's Investors Service downgraded their debt because that was such a large number. And when you ask who would want to do business with them, that really is the million-dollar question because here Brown University has voluntarily decided to partner with them to buy Care New England system, as you said at the outset, yes, the second largest system in the state. Why is Brown doing that? They're crazy. They're going to destroy their own reputation by uh, hitching their, uh, hitching their uh, wagon to uh, prospect. Brown University, I mean, we all looked up to Brown University. We, 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 I, I brag to people about it that I live in the neighborhood. And uh, it's a terrific university. Why are they dirtying their hands with this? I mean, it's making them look really, really bad. A university like that, with that kind of reputation, and, and getting in bed with these, with these kind of cats, I mean, it's just, uh, I don't understand it. What's behind it? What do they gain from it? I'm speculating, but I think what they gain from it is that Partners, the big health system out of Boston, is currently in negotiations with Care New England to do a deal and Brown does not have a seat at that table. And Partners is affiliated with Harvard University, not Brown University. And what we suspect, our union suspects, is that the reason why Brown and Care New England are essentially, I'm sorry, Brown and Prospect are essentially trying to do a Care New England deal against Care New England's will, mm -hmm. is because I think Brown University is really worried about the fact that if Partners actually does the deal, they're gonna be left out in the cold because there's no affiliation between Brown and um, partners, but boy, that's a hell of a risk to put, put your reputation at risk by doing business with Prospect. It's a big mistake, by the way, we met with representatives of Brown and we told them this and we shared them specific information about their bad record on the West Coast and the East. It apparently has gone in one ear and out the other. Yeah, you know, they got an Adama to think about too. Uh, what would your advice be to their <clears throat> potential partners? Uh, when you say their potential partners, you mean Prospect? Mm-hmm. Uh, I would tell anybody who is considering doing business with Prospect, including Brown University, you're making a big mistake. Because here's the deal. These guys are not from here. They don't care about Rhode Island. They care about their shareholders. They're looking to turn a profit. They're always nickel and diamond folks. And at the end of the day, what that means is that their employees are going to suffer and the quality of patient care is going to suffer. And that's exactly what's happened in California. It's exactly what's happened in Rhode Island. In fact, in December, this past December 2017, the uh, Providence Business News ran an article. And uh, it said that the reimbursement rates were reduced at Roger Williams and Fatima, owned and operated by Prospect, mm -hmm. because they finished in the bottom quartile of 3,300 hospitals surveyed across the country. High patient injury rates, high infection rates. Think about that. So they're just cutting corners, and it's not good. So this is happening in the state of Rhode Island, where we, we pride ourselves on having excellent patient care. And I'm sure that uh, uh, a lot of these hospitals, Brown University included, uh, being involved in this cabal, don't 
want the public to know about this. And, and, and maybe it's possible that a lot of the public don't know about this, but should know. So what is your local union doing? What are, what are your members doing uh, to uh, bring this to light to the community? So we've uh, launched a campaign where we have run radio spots. We have done mass mailings. We have done picketing. We have appeared on a variety of talk shows, thankfully including yours, to make Rhode Islanders aware of the dangers that are posed by prospect buying more hospitals in this state. Uh, and as I said, we filed complaints with the NLRB that are now going to lead to litigation and a trial against them, meaning prospect of force and disclosing information. By the way, I would also tell you, Jim, mm -hmm. that it's not just uh, patient care, which of course is the most important thing, but these guys just lost a, an arbitration in Pennsylvania to the tune of $21 million. And the case was simple. When you buy hospitals down there, Instead of paying money to the hospitals you buy, you put it in a nonprofit foundation, in this instance a foundation that was uh, charged with providing care to the most vulnerable citizens down there in Delaware County. At the end of the day, Prospect reneged on the deal, shorted them $21 million, the foundation took them to arbitration, they won, and Prospect had to cough up to $20 million, $21 million. In addition to that, Prospect has bounced their property tax checks to three uh, local school districts down there. So, you know, if, 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 if it's not patient care that's going south, it's, it's their obligations to pay their taxes, it's their obligations to local foundations. They're just, they're just lousy corporate citizens and bad guys. So they pay four, uh, $600 million uh, in dividends to their shareholders while they're dishing out big money down in Pennsylvania for being bad businessmen and giving bad care to, uh, to their patients. I don't understand how they can be, uh, they must be an incredibly profitable company. Uh, they are a profitable company because they're making their money uh, by shortchanging employees and, uh, and shortchanging uh, patients. Um, and of course, the larger question here is, when they and Brown announced that they might want to do a Care New England deal against Care New England's will, the governor came out and said some fairly positive things about it, Mr. Uh -huh. McKee, the lieutenant governor. Uh -huh. um, they haven't calculated what it means when $600 million goes to shareholders. That means that the financial commitments that Prospect is supposed to be making here in Rhode Island and where they have hospitals elsewhere like Jersey and Pennsylvania and Connecticut and Texas, that that money's going to shareholders. Much of it is not staying in the local community yeah. and they ought to pay attention to it. And who is staying in the local community? The people that are members of your union and other unions who do the great work for patient care here in Rhode Island. And when you've got a company like that, you've got to sit down and negotiate a contract with them when they have not only no respect for their own employees, but, but are giving bad care to people. We all know, I said it before, safe staffing saves lives. And, uh, well, it's been a pleasure to have you on the program today. I think a lot of people are going to find out today, and I understand you were on uh, Bill Rapley's show uh, as well uh, just I recently, was. too. I was, yes. So we'll finally get this information out to the community, and hopefully uh, you're going to continue your efforts with your membership and uh, with the media to let the, let the public and let everybody know that this is going on and it shouldn't be going on. We need to take care of the people that are in our hospitals and in our health care centers. Amen, and thank you for the opportunity to come on your show, Jimmy. Thank you for coming on. All the best. All right. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.